<clears throat> Let me just go over this. Uh, uh, Liam started out with Fugro, um, um, a geodata company specializing in delivering information to clients. Uh, he was leading and writing the MedOcean software solution for Fugro, uh, BP, and ConocoPhillips. In 2012, he joined, 2012, he joined uh, OSRL um, and set up their geomatics department. He currently is not in that position anymore, but he created the role of technology and innovation lead where he is right now. And uh, Liam is going to speak to us on building a situational awareness capability in your response teams. Liam, you out there, ready to roll? I see you yeah, broken. can you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you fine. So I'm going to bug out till about two minutes before your, your time's up. Awesome. Thanks very much. Good morning to a majority of you. Um, as just pointed out, it's about just coming up to 5 p.m. here in the UK, but it's great to talk to you all. Um, and I'm going to talk to you, whilst it's still about technology and we, we're using Esri technology as well, it's a little bit less about the technology itself, more about how we're trying to implement it and how we're trying to upskill different people and um, leverage the tools that we've got in-house. Um, we don't have a great big GIS team, so we're looking to upskill responders and see how far that can get us before we um, get ourselves into trouble. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about the journey that I've been on over the last year with this um, new role that I've got. Um, there are some videos in here, so let's hope they um, all work out. Um, before diving into that, many of you probably know who OSRL are, some may not, so I've added this slide just quickly to touch on it. Um, if you're going to take anything away about who OSRL are, we're a global oil spill response organization. Um, we're not a commercial company, we're a cooperative, so we have members. Um, each pay a subscription or a membership fee. Um, and we've got around about 170 members ranging from the large energy providers all the way down to ports and harbors. And this funding mechanism allows us to provide additional expert personnel anywhere in the world, as well as being able to have the mechanism to fund some pretty large pieces of kit, um, whether it's things like the Hercules and the aviation assets that we've got, through to well caps or the offset installation, these big bits of kit which are useful in all over the world, which would otherwise be quite price prohibitive. So that's OSRL. In terms of myself, uh, I, I didn't create the role, I kind of got pushed into the role, um, but it, it's a great role to be in, especially at the moment. Um, I pitched a project to our exec teams the last Oh, two years ago now, um, about this idea about leveraging our existing digital tools better and upskilling some responders so they could solve some of their own digital problems without having to go out there. And the remainder of this presentation is how I've got on during that first year, what's worked, more importantly, what, what I failed at doing in certain areas, what, what troubles I fell into. So if anyone else finds themselves in a similar situation, they'll be able to... Um, leverage some of these lessons learned or just tell me that I was an idiot for trying it that way to begin with. The last presentation actually showed quite nicely what the opportunities are. Um, dashboards, tools to collect data in the field, all of this stuff really resonates with a lot of organizations. You want to get rid of all these paper workflows as much as possible so that you can improve situational awareness. The faster you can get data from the fields into a common operating platform or into the hands of the decision makers, the faster you're going to make good decisions and the, far, the better the res end result's going to be. So we're looking at leveraging that. And it is amazing how many times I walk into a command center in various places around the world, regardless of the size of the organization, and see large amounts of pieces of paper and well-populated whiteboards on the wall. So there's definitely it's definitely a current challenge. It's not something that's easing, despite the fact that technology is moving really quickly. So the EEOC project, which was a working title, but it's stuck. So um, I'm stuck with it now, which just stands for Electronic EOC. Um, it focused in three areas, and this should be familiar with quite a lot of people. It's the area of people, technology, and process. The, in the area of people, we focused on responders building the tools for themselves, accepting that that's going to 
make tools slower to produce and they won't necessarily be as polished as someone doing it from a professional point of view but at least we know or we've got really good confidence that the problems getting solved are the problems that really exist on the front line and the solutions are ones that they can get along with so we're focusing on their most important problems and within this project especially we gave them the freedom to really challenge the status quo which within our response teams is uh, is unusual to do it's usually um it's a harder process to challenge existing um, processes um so we pushed them to innovate effectively um from a technology standpoint there's some fantastic platforms out there that do very specific things for emergency management um, and we're aware of them and we keep looking at them um but in especially this year where we were a little bit catch strapped because of the COVID um, situation around the world, we wanted to look at what we've got in house and really leverage it better. I, I can see both with Microsoft Office 365 and especially in the context of this um, conference, the Esri Arc GIS technology, both of those we know a majority of our members and a majority of our customers have those technologies in house. But I, from my experience, people are not leveraging them to their full extent. So I wanted to focus on that. And the last thing which was really out there for OSRO was this um, the way in which we rolled out these tools. Rolling out a solution from having the idea to having something working on a global scale over the period of 28 calendar days is very different to the way things are currently done. There's a lot more time spent in quality assurance, a lot more time spent debating the different solutions, a lot more time spent making sure that the final product is polished before it goes out the door. And I wanted to challenge that mainly because technology is moving so quickly now that if you spend too long building a solution, you find your solutions out of date by the time it's going out the door. So I wanted to try and push really the entire response department into this new mindset of having something fit for purpose, but not necessarily polished um, every 28 days. And also give them the idea that they can update it really, really fast. I mean, we can update an app eight times in a day as we're on the phone to someone. So it's, it's that new mindset that we're trying to push forward. Um, and the last bit of this is, I, I like this Venn diagram. It's, it's a nice Venn diagram. Um, it balances everything out but it's really important that it is just a model and you can get all three of those things right and get it wrong still because you need to focus on the right problem. Drilling down into finding the right problems to solve and how you're solving them is really important before you even start. So the laser focus on the end user. The next few slides are gonna focus on those three areas, the people, the technology, and the process. And I've started in one which was particularly successful last year. The way in which I brought responders up um, had an awful lot of good feedback at the end of the year. Um, one of the things that worked really well that we adopted quite quickly was with both Office 365 and ArcGIS, there's an awful lot of training material out there, and it is really impressive training material, but it's abstract compared to the general day-to-day -day problems. My early thoughts were that people would just see the link, but part of that um, belief is based on the fact that I've been looking at this stuff for two to three years and have made those connections over that kind of time period. In trying to bring up a team in a new technology, it's it was really important to show how they could apply their abstract learning to real OSRL problems. And we, we balanced that early on, and that worked really well. The other one, now I'm not sure whether Dragon's Den exists in the US. I think that there's another um, a US program called Shark's Tank, which might um, be the same kind of thing, but it's really, you're, you've got an idea, you've, you pitch it to four entrepreneurs and they effectively pull you apart um, to find out whether it works. Um, and we, we applied the same methodology here. We, we set the, the, well, the responders found a problem that they wanted to work with. We gave them some training, upskilling, and some freedom to look around the problem. And then we split them into two teams and they went off for 28 days and worked separately to come up with two competing solutions, which they then pitched back to senior managers and even members of the exec team. Um, and that, but without the risk of being shot down because of failure and things like that. And that actually was an incredibly powerful way of getting them motivated. One, you've got that pressure of the deadline at the end, 
Um, another is you're competing with your colleagues. Um, and at the end of it, really, we found that we probably delivered twice as much work in the same time period. Um, you've got two products which are very similar in what they're trying to deliver. So you can cherry pick the good parts or you can choose one over the other. Um, so that was a really effective way of doing it. And something that was less effective was this um, stakeholder engagement. Communication is always going to be something that you want to do a lot of. And every everybody that talks about innovation says that engaging your stakeholders is critical and engaging your stakeholders is critical. Um, but there's sometimes you believe that just hitting the top level, like I said, I got exec buy-in, I got senior managers buy-in. Um, then I went to the responders and had those guys work with me and they started to see the value of this. And my belief was that through osmosis from above and below, everyone in the middle would get on board naturally. Uh, the result was a sharp shock when we tried to release anything to um, the guys that hadn't been involved directly because they weren't as engaged. They, they've got their jobs going on simultaneously. So more stakeholder engagement, understanding the different levels in your structure that you're trying to engage with um, was really key. On to the technology side of things. And as I've said, we focused on the two pieces of technology that most of you guys have got in-house already um, to varying degrees with various bolt-ons and things like that. That's Office 365, which has grown substantially in the last few years. So that's all the icons in the bottom right. Um, and then the Esri toolbox to be searching to find all their logos. But there's an awful lot of applications that can be further customized to deliver solutions and can work alongside one another. So really, the, the ability of combining all these tools to deliver a workflow is entirely possible and you can deliver some pretty impressive results especially if you're working off the starting point which is pen and paper um, and this is what we did really we introduced them to each of the esri tools and some of the office 365 tools we set them a problem and off they went and what you've got on the left is is currently a prototype it's not rolled out the idea is that um, we do aerial surveillance around the world and one of the things they have is a paper form or a paper process to collect um, oil spill information when they're flying, uh, not an aircraft like you can see there, but just an aircraft of opportunity. So we took the paper form and we replicated um, that and played around with it and that's what you can see flashing on the side. But as they were doing it, they also thought that they could solve another problem, which was currently they have to create a GPS track of where they're going. And they do that by having a separate GPS tracker, which when they land, they have to download and pass all the information through and send the file off. And it all takes quite a long time. So what they did is they, on the tablet, they combined survey one, two, three and quick capture alongside each other to do jobs simultaneously. So quick capture there is collecting your position every 0.5 of a second, whilst also tagging what you're doing at that position. So whether you're taking off, you're in transit, you're surveying. All the time, they can just leave that running and conduct the aerial surveillance tool. It was, it's an impressive use of the technology. There's a few problems with it. Tablets don't necessarily like both of them um, working side by side at the same time, especially when taking a photo. Um, but it's a, it's a great use of the technology. And the last one, which is definitely a work in progress, was this ambition to launch something every 28 days. I love this. I, I read a lot on kind of productivity, project management, agile project management, how the software guys do it, how all these super uber majors do it. Um, and so I wanted to have a go again. This is not the first time I've attempted to bring agile and sprints into um, OSRL. Um, and it hasn't worked previously either. But we've tried, I tried to create this culture of planning a little bit, designing, building, testing, releasing, talking to all the stakeholders and launching in a 28 day cycle, and then repeat the process, making it better and better as you go along. And it didn't work. And there's a number of reasons that I think it didn't work. One, I alluded to the fact that I had responders working on the project. What I didn't say is that they weren't full time with me. They were maybe effectively 20, 25% of their time was spent with me. Um, that went up a little bit thanks to COVID because they were all forced to work at home, which this project really um, helps deliver. But it's, uh, 
but they weren't dedicated, which makes it even harder to deliver in a 28 day period. So that's, that's an acceptable reason why it didn't um, meet that goal. The multidiscipline side of things is really important that you, as I said, the stakeholders need to be there, but from all the levels needed to be involved in the project. So it would have been better had the project included someone kind of in the middle, the what we call the duty manager or an incident manager, the people that are in charge of a spill um, and our mobilization. So we've corrected that for this year. But the last two things are probably the harder thing, which is this the fact that they're not culturally ready for a 28 day release cycle, it's not in their DNA. They're used to long spin up times, lots of testing, lots of quality assurance. Um, and when this gets released, that's it, it's out the door, it's finished. We can draw a line onto it and move on to the next one. Whereas what I'm pet petitioning with this is it needs to keep evolving, it needs to be ready to go for a spill, but also it can be adapted on the spill without a detriment on the quality assurance. It's that flexible. So this is still a work in progress. It's still me trying to champion um, this. There, there will inevitably be compromises on both sides. But as I said at the beginning, I think the, the goal of releasing something every 28 days really needs to stay because the technology is getting released on that kind of, is getting improved on that kind of time scale. So to move our goal means we're constantly going to keep drifting behind. Um, so I'm going to keep pushing that and I'm going forward. So, oh, as I suspected, I, I've talked slightly faster than I am planned. Um, this last slide is less about what OSRL are doing and really what I'm trying to champion within OSRL. Um, OSRL and Esri became partners kind of middle of last, well, September last year um, with kind of a, an early stage vision about what we were seeing. We, we and by we, we mean I and Esri both see value in GIS in oil spill response. So I don't think anyone on this call will argue with the fact that it's valuable. But we're seeing within our membership, those 170 organizations, a full spectrum of people from the GIS super gods over on one side, all the way through to those that don't really know what GIS is. And what we're seeing is an opportunity to help those that don't see what it is so that if they do have an incident, they've got these tools to hand. So it's a way of giving those members the same kind of capabilities that we've got. Um, but to make their life easier, again, these ready-made oil spill tools, you'll know on ArcGIS Online, it has a SCAT template and it's taking that a step further and kind of developing these tools um, and these templates to help regardless of where you are in the world, it gives you a really fast starting point. Um, another thing that's not really used that much within oil spill responses globally is the opportunity that the Esri Disaster Response Programme can offer. Um, and that's a really fast way as well to kind of get technology in, into the front lines of a spill. Um, so to try and get both OSRL and Esri teams together with whoever else is on the ground. And the last kind of two really is, is looking at, the, the, we know that there's some fantastic stuff out there being developed. Irma's got some amazing tools. We've seen things in Australia, which are really impressive. Um, and it's about trying to work out a way to share those initiatives and share those things in a way that they can be adopted. It's not that they're not being shared, it's that people just don't know about it. The connection between the GIS professionals and the oil spill experts and the oil spill response agencies, there's a disconnect there in some parts of the world. So we're looking for a way to try and balance those up. Um, and again, I need to highlight this. This is my idea. I'm still pitching this internally as well as externally. So if it doesn't materialize, don't say that OSRL plan to do it. It's, it's my plan. Um, and hopefully we can get them all on board. So with that, with oh, about a minute to spare, I want to thank you very much for um, allowing me to talk to you today. I'm happy to ask any question, answer any questions. And almost certainly I'd love to ask some, but we will save that for another time. Yeah, well, thank you, Liam. Um, uh, I like your comment about a common, common operational picture because that, that's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time when the concept of COP was first introduced. Um, there were many and they had nothing in common. Uh, yeah. I think that's changed a lot these days. And 
And, uh, and we're going to get another presentation, our next one uh, from TRG about their uh, common operational picture. So uh, there's a lot of work being done along those lines. And, uh, and yes, everybody in the world uses ESRI software. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's no way around that. And uh, it's a good thing. Uh, we're all on the same platform. Yeah. Um, Lindsay, do we have any questions from the uh, audience? We have a couple of questions, some from the audience and some from panelists. So if you're able to answer this, Liam, please don't feel like if you can't, don't press on, but. Um, <laughs> That's always what, a good way to start a question. <laughs> had to throw in that preface. So what recent or current global responses is OSRL involved in, for example, tracking and responding to the Israeli spill event? We, we monitor all, all of them. Um, we join um, those that we get invited to. So obviously I can't share anything that we are involved in. We, we obviously monitor all the global events, but we'll, we'll step in only if we're, we're asked to step in. Um, yeah, that's probably as far as I can say. Got it. And another <laughs> question from a panelist. Uh, when is your next on water oil spill exercise? It's normally every two years. Yeah. Uh, probably, um, the financial situation has paused it, I believe, and it's a skeleton of an idea at the moment within my department, is that we're thinking next year, um, if we can get our acts together and if we can get through the um, authorization process. I've got some big plans with that exercise, um, hopefully to try and open it up, um, make, it, make the findings more transparent, So I think that was one of the um, failings of the last one is to share the data and share the information wider, which I'm sure will please people. Great. And another question from Chris Weiss. How did you decide on 28 days as the time frame for production? Ah, I chose 28 days relatively arbitrarily. I mean, looking at, I, I'm, I'm basing it off Scrum, I don't know how much you're familiar with it, and 28 days tends to be the longest possible time they recommend to be an iteration. So I chose it relatively arbitrarily. And a follow up to that question, uh, how many 28 day periods are in a 20 year career? <laughs> <laughs> Lots. <laughs> Okay, if that's it, Lindsay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on. And Liam, again, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. And uh, I guess it's dinner time. Yeah, I've got to pick up a toddler first, but yes, it is. Okay. All right. Have <laughs> Thanks, a, have everybody. A, have a great day.